But what I see is no longer a corrupted educational system. I see now a cult, an evil cult, <clears throat> which has no interest. We have no industry anymore. We don't have scientists anymore. We have just a few of them. We couldn't staff the projects that we were staffing 20 years ago. We don't have the people. We don't have the brains anymore. So therefore, the problem is the universities have become instruments of our intellectual destruction when they should have been, as they were set up to be in large part, uh, typical the American, we were to, to develop our capabilities for changing the world, for the benefit of the world as a whole, not to create an empire. That's the problem. Why did we allow our premier intellectual defense to become a tool of our enemies? The idea of controlling a society by controlling the curricula at a handful of its leading universities, which then set the standard for all institutions, is not new. The precedent for this was the Royal Society's creation of the synthetic personality of Isaac Newton. If you take any physics class or mathematics class today in the universities, you'll run into sections which are attributed to the great genius of Newton. Nobody leaves these classes knowing anything about uh, who Newton was or who Kepler was or who um, Einstein was or who any of these guys were. You just leave with a bunch of mathematical garbage in your head thinking, well, Newton must be the greatest mathematician in the universe ever. It is still questionable whether Isaac Newton was a real person. What is not up for debate is that his associates attempted to plagiarize the results of Johannes Kepler's discovery of universal gravitation and then packaged this crude act of plagiarism in a book with Newton's name on the cover. Absolutely no evidence was given in the book that Newton had discovered anything at all. He's not even capable of expressing in a clear way the philosophical views that he's credited with. All the places where you have an explicit discussion of the, the details and the logical consequences of so-called Newtonian philosophy are written by other people. A student reading the published works of Johannes Kepler can follow step by step how Kepler thought as he hypothesized the organizing principles of the solar system. However, the associates of Newton selected those few results from Kepler that could be written as neat mathematical formulas and then arranged them as logical derivations from a few initial axioms. What is the gravitational force? If this is an object, capital M, and you can think of this as being the Earth if you want to, and there is here an object, little m, then I have to know what the forces are between the two. And this now is, the, is Newton's universal law of gravity, which he postulated, universal law of gravity. He says the force that little m experiences, this force equals, I'll put a little m here and a capital M here, so it is Little m experiences that force due to the presence of capital M equals little m times capital M times a constant, which Newton in his days didn't know yet what that value was, divided by r squared, if r is the distance between the two. Read the letters of Newton's contemporary John Flamsteed. Flamsteed is a, a real scientist in the model of Kepler, and he is interested about the inverse square law. And he's had some discussions with Newton about it, and he points out the people who become, you know, who just wet their pants over it, 
the, what, what, the mo what modern professors do, the people who did that in Newton's time were all the people who hung around the court, not the scientists, were all these fluffy people who were around kissing ass trying to get in good with some prince or some lord or somebody with position. They went crazy over Newton's ideas. The actual, the actual astronomers could do nothing with it. The Principia had no effect on observational astronomy. In reality, Newton's infamous inverse square law can be easily derived from Kepler's principles, and other principles well known by the late 17th century. In 1618, Kepler discovered his so-called harmonic, sesquialterate law, which states that the ratio of two individual planets' years squared is always equal to the ratio of those two planets' mean distances from the Sun cubed. This principle, which yokes all planets to the same system, can be stated in another way. The ratio of any planet's mean distance from the Sun cubed to its orbital period squared is the same for all planets in the solar system. Later, Christian Huygens, a follower of Kepler, discovered the principles of infinitesimal changes in rotational velocity, which he called centripetal acceleration. Newton's handlers simply plagiarized these two discoveries as math formulas and derived Newton's inverse square force law from them. hypotheses in Newton. The so-called consequences of his work, this idea of the belief in an absolute space, the belief in an absolute time, the belief in action at a distance through gravitation, what's represented mathematically in his inverse square laws, all stem from a form of religious belief that he tried to cover up with his, his adage, the uh, I don't make hypotheses. <laughs> What it really meant was, I don't want to talk about my hypotheses because they're crazy as hell. <laughs> the calculus was actually developed by the intellectual inspiration of the United States, Gottfried Leibniz. The evidence that Newton had independently created the calculus was supposedly tucked away in a trunk of papers which he had produced while a student at Trinity College. The contents of this trunk were to have vindicated Newton once and for all, to reveal his true genius for all the world to see. John Maynard Keynes, a bad economist and Newton worshiper, was able to purchase this trunk in the 1930s, and he delivered a lecture in the 1940s after investigating its contents. So he bought this trunk thinking that finally the, all the work going into the calculus by Newton will finally, will, we found it, it's in here. So he opens the trunk up, he actually gives numbers of pages, he says, I found 100,000 pages of work on pure alchemy, alchemy and, and black magic, actually he calls it Babylonian magic. He says there's thousands of pages on, on biblical revelation, on biblical prophecy, nothing on calculus, there's absolutely nothing on science in the trunk. And these were all of, the, all of his notes and so forth that he was taking uh, at Trinity University. So the question... Is, was raised in my mind, well, if this was everything that Newton was doing in his spare time, where is the science? 